Hello and welcome to another episode of the Investor Guys podcast. This is a Thursday edition. We are uh, December 16th already. Wow. Yeah. We are, do you realize we are less than 10 days away from Christmas? That is, that is crazy. Yeah. That just literally struck we're, me. We're right like, so. we're like four shows away from 2022. Yeah. By the I way, like, this is, uh, yeah. I think, show 155. Nice. 155. Thank you very much, sir. Today we are following up on show number 152, where we went over the three steps that everybody who is successful in business, whether you're a real estate investor or not, the three steps that you have to know, have to understand, have to master if you want to be a master of business. And that was analyze capitalize and execute. So we covered those three steps in that show. And we, we went over basically what you need for each one. Then we did three shows. This is the third uh, to basically emphasize each one of those steps and what you have to have. And again, we've, we've mentioned this, but I really want to emphasize it strongly. Each one of these steps are interdependent upon each other. You need to understand your capitalization and your execution when you put together your analysis. You need to have your analysis and your execution in place when you go to seek your capitalization. Your capitalization is going to account for your execution, but it's going to be based upon your analysis. When you come to execute, you are executing based upon the expectations of your capitalization and the analysis that you put together, which should cover your execution. We are going to go over execution today. What do you want to say about uh, anything that we're going to talk about today, Bill? Well, I, I want to start with a, a, co- a quote from John McKay, who was the original Tampa Bay Buccaneers coach when they first uh, got the franchise. Uh, and he was asked uh, midway through their first season when they went 0-15, um, he was asked, what do you think about uh, your team's execution today? And he said, I'm all for it. So what we're looking at is the ability to be able to go in uh, and take what we've learned. I was injected with a little humor there. Uh, so take what we learned. If you analyze your numbers, so we talked about um, – doing the numbers, we talked about, you know, analyzing, we talked about capitalization, uh, analysis, capitalization, execution. So uh, if you trust the numbers, so if you do the numbers right, and look, you're going to build trust in the numbers, the more property that you look at, the more times you run the numbers, um, I routinely get when I'm doing uh, consulting, and we're looking at, at rentals and flips and, and apartment complexes. And we walk through and I say, I think it'll be $62,000. And then a detailed analysis by the consulting client comes back and a day or two later, they go, wow, it came in at, at 61,875. How do you do that? Like I've looked at 10,000 homes that, that I've run the numbers on and a thousand or so that I've probably made contractual offers on. And so when you start looking at that, you build a confidence and it certainly doesn't take 10,000, but you build a confidence in the numbers, the numbers. If you are doing it the way that we tell you to do it, the way you tell them, the way I tell them, we the way we tell them to do it, they can have confidence in the number. So your analysis gets you to a number that you can have a strong confidence in. When you couple that with the fact that you've also put together capitalization. So now I've got good, strong numbers. And I know I got the money to do that. When I got both of these, I've got no reason not to execute. Now, we still have people out there that call themselves real estate investors that have an inability to pull the trigger. 
that's when you got to get out of your own head and get into the fact that, hey, I didn't develop these numbers. Kevin, Bill, and hundreds of guys before them uh, that they've learned from through the years, and, and you and I collectively have been doing this 60, 70 years uh, collectively. <laughs> uh, and so the numbers work. They're solid. They're strong. The formulas are correct. If I know that, and I know that I'm doing the math correctly, then I've got no reason to doubt the number. Then if I've got my money committed, I've got no reason not to pull the trigger. And that's the part of analysis that uh, one of the things I really want to focus on today is pulling the trigger when you know the numbers are right and stop doubting yourself. If you run them, and, and not and not a plug for ourselves, just on the analysis. This underscores exactly what, what Bill is saying right here. For each one of these steps, for everything that you do in this business, okay, or any business for that matter, having the right people on your team, and that means consultants, okay, having the right people on your team, whether it's Bill and I or anybody else, okay to help you through each one of these steps, who understands each one of these steps. And you may have a great understanding of each one of these steps, but having more eyes on what is going on and having more eyes that understand the situation is going to be a benefit to you. The other thing that you have to remember and, and keep this in mind when you're looking for consultants, okay? Is your consultant going to be able to help you better analyze opportunities, okay? If so, yes, that's a consultant that you want on your team. Is your consultant going to be able to go over different capitalization options with you? Maybe even bring capitalization options to the table for you. Yep. If yes, that is a consultant you want on your team. Is your consultant going to be able to help you execute your plan? Are they going to have ideas? Are they going to have input? Are they going to have possibly have potential uh, end users and buyers? for what your execution is going to be? If the answer is yes, that's a consultant that you want on your team. Now, you may be able to find a consultant who can do all three things. And that's what Bill and I do. We actually focus on all three of those things. You may also find a consultant who's good for, for just one of those things, okay? If capitalization is something that you need to be very strong on, you can find a consultant who's focused on just capitalization. Uh, if you need a, a consultant who's good on execution, OK, you can find someone who's good for execution. Now, while we're talking about consulting and team members, remember, there's other team members that you can include into all of this as well. Uh, an excellent team member for your analysis and for your execution are going to be professional real estate sales agents, professional real estate brokers. OK, those are people that you need to include on your team for each one of these processes. They can also be resources for capitalization. Now, we're up on a break, but we're going to continue with this thread of thought as soon as we get back. See you in just a minute. Welcome back. And uh, today we're talking about capitalization. It is, sorry, today we're talking about execution. <laughs> execution. Uh, so we're talking yeah. about capitalization. Uh, third step in our analysis, capitalization, execution, um, formula for success. Um, Bill was on a roll and I kind of interrupted him because I wanted to really point out what he was talking. It was just because it was appropriate at that particular point. I didn't mean yeah. to interrupt you necessarily. Sure. Uh, just before you got off onto another line of thought and before we got up on the break, I wanted to point out that having the right people on your team is important and having the right consultants on your team is very important. Bill said that your confidence in having the right numbers, your confidence in doing each one of these is gonna be based upon your experience, but you can also base that upon the experience of the people on your team, the experience of the people who are consulting for the second, third, fourth, fifth set of eyes that are on this particular project. So I'll let you continue on with your, uh, with your role there, Bill. So I'm going to I'm going to make a consulting plug. Yes, for both of us, because I know the quality of depth uh, that we do from consulting. But I, I would say this for anybody that's looking at a consultant period. And that is your consultant should have a breadth of knowledge and experience to the point that you can have the confidence in them. So when the consultant, when I tell my clients, when you tell your clients, when I say, this is a good deal, do the deal. 
they have 100% confidence that they can do the deal. And, and I let them know when, when we start doing consulting, hey, look, you know what? We're going to cross this bridge. We're going to get to this point. And as we get to this point, you're going to be nervous about, well, I don't want to make a mistake at all. So I'm going to, I'm going to take that nervousness away from you right now. I'm going to put it on me so that when I tell you this deal works, take it and run with it. Uh, you have the confidence to do that because ultimately it's their name that goes on the contract, not yours, not mine. However, I've also um, in multiple cases through the years, uh, four or five different times, have been with a client, said this deal works. They were still hesitant. And I'm like, okay, you have 30 seconds. At the end of that 30 seconds, if you haven't said, Bill, we're doing this deal, I'm taking it. I don't want to hear anything else about it. This is a good deal. I'm, I, I'm fine if you skip on it because I'm taking it. Now, if that doesn't tell you more than anything, you should do this deal, then you're just not paying attention. And, and that's okay. But no, if you hesitate, this conversation's over. We'll move on to the next one because I'm going to take this and we're going to go on. And that's usually um, the last push. And, and I've never had anybody not do that deal when we get to that point. And, and thank goodness out of hundreds and hundreds of consulting clients through the years, that, that's happened four or five times. But that's what you got to have is the confidence in the people you work with. Uh, if you're an agent... Consider if Bill's not going to do that deal, there's a dozen or more people out there who are also looking at this deal who are going to do it unless you've got some sort of an exclusive on it, which is very, very rare. If it's a good deal, you may not get it just because you wasted too much time thinking about it. Yep. Somebody else will yep. jump on it. If it looks like a great deal, jump on it. You don't, you're committing to it, but you're not locked in stone for literally another week True. or two. Just because you sign the deal message, you make the offer doesn't mean that you're, if, if, if numbers change somehow and you're afraid that you're missing something, okay, jump on the deal, lock it up, and then reanalyze those numbers, go over all those numbers again, call somebody like Bill or myself or somebody else who knows what they're doing, have them look at the numbers, because if you yep. hesitate, then you will lose the deal. Uh, and not just from somebody like Bill, not just from the person you're, you're, you're you're talking to literally somebody else is looking at that deal as well as yourself. Yeah. You yeah. hesitate. It will be gone. Bill may say, Hey, you know what? You don't want this deal in 30 seconds. I'm going to take it 30 seconds. Bill, Bill makes that offer. Maybe go. <laughs> Bill may not have gotten that offer. Okay. Yeah. So he who hesitates loses. Keep that in mind all the time. That doesn't mean just go out and start writing offers. That means if you see a good deal and you know what your guidelines are, and we talked about this on our first show, understand what your outline is, understand what your parameters are, understand what your blueprint is, okay? If you've got a deal that fits into that blueprint, it's part of that blueprint, jump on it, okay? If you've got a, another week or two to do analysis while you're waiting for the acceptance of the offer, okay, go ahead and do it. OK, if it reinforces what you thought because it fits into your blueprint. Awesome. If you missed something, OK, because you were in a hurry or you didn't have a second set of eyes on it. OK, it's not too late to back out of the deal. They come back with with an acceptance and say, you know what, I, I did the numbers and I realized that it, it's not that and I'm going to resend my offer. It's that simple. That. Yeah. Simple. yeah, every state contract and, and, you know, you and I both uh, owning brokerage firms. Um, fully support the use of the state authorized contract in whatever state you're in. And every state contract has an inspection period. So you can execute a contract. That property is effectively off the market. You have control of it now. And you have seven, 10, five, whatever uh, negotiated time frame you have for the inspection of the property. Uh, so at that point, you can go back out of the deal if something pops up. Now, if you don't have the experience, I think you should hire a qualified licensed inspector to go look at. When you get doing this stuff as, as much as Kevin and I have, it's rare that, that uh, I ever get an inspector here in Texas. Why? Because I know the market and the houses and what to look for. Now, when I'm buying out of state, other than hopping on a plane, I'm going to call an inspector in those markets and say, hey, I've, I've got this property under contract. Need you go look at it. Can you do it in this time frame? 
get it back to me and still have me still have a day or so anyway to uh, look through the inspection report and see if I want to move forward or not. And it's very rare that something has popped up that I go, hey, you know what? I need to back out of this deal. And I'm, the only thing I have put at risk there is what it cost me to have the home inspection. So 375 to five and a quarter, basically, that'll, that'll pretty much cover you anywhere in the country. And people, ooh, I don't wanna lose that money. Well, that's better than making a bad decision and it costing you thousands and thousands of dollars. But it also gives you until you get to the level of confidence that you and I have, that Kevin and I have, until you get to that level of confidence, this inspection report gives you the fact that I have a trained, licensed set of eyes going in who has nothing at stake in this game. They've already gotten paid. Everything they're going to make out of that deal, they got the minute you paid them to go do the inspection. And then they're going to go in and it's their job to find as much as they possibly can. So nothing gets left to chance so that the person hiring them can't come back and say, oh, you missed something that cost me money and sue them. So they, they do everything. They're, we have them that come back and say, oh, this window is missing a screen. Okay. Um, well, you know, I, I'm going to notice that, but okay, good. That, that's the kind of detail they get down into. And so that gives you confidence. Once you understand the value of the analysis and the numbers and everything's working there and you've got your money lined up, pull the trigger. Yes. And depending upon your source of capitalization, they may require that you have a licensed inspector yeah. go over the property. Yeah. And I'm not talking about just for a residential property. I've had my capital sources want an inspection of commercial properties, large commercial properties. Yeah. They want yeah. literally go out and do a top to bottom, comb through it, you know, want to know every single detail and the condition of everything. Um, before they're willing to back it up with the capital. Now we're up on a break, but we'll be back with more on execution. We are back today talking about the final step in our analysis, capitalization, execution. Today is execution. That is essentially making sure that once you've done your analysis, it's a solid analysis, you've gotten your capitalization, you've acquired the property or you're acquiring the property is really part, the beginning part of execution, uh, that you are seeing it through with strategy that matches your analysis. So whether that was a flip or whether that was a buy and hold or any other strategy that you're planning on doing, that is part of your execution. That is our final step. That's what we are talking about today. Um, a lot of that is going to be dependent upon the type of property and the type of strategy that you are looking at for that particular property. If you understand these three steps, you're going to be successful. If you're able to master these three steps, step number four is basically repeat. You're going to repeat this with another property, and then you're going to repeat it again with another property, repeat it again with another property. And keep in mind that we don't have to do this one property at a time. Once we understand these steps and we're able to master, we can be doing this with, with three properties, 10 properties, 20 properties, 200 properties, yeah. if you had that scale and ability. And again, that goes back to having a team. Obviously, you're not going to be able to do 200 properties at a time unless you have a strong, solid team behind you. Um, more on execution, Bill. Well, and we were talking about doing the due diligence and you had mentioned commercial properties. Look, when you start buying apartment complexes like you and I do occasionally, uh, you have to have outside due diligence on the funding. They're, they don't care that we've got money at stake here as well. If they're doing the lending, they're saying, hey, we've got, and a lot of times in, in these properties, you have an extended due diligence period. You may have two months all the way up to six months due diligence, depending on the size of the property. And the lender is saying, who's doing the due diligence? Kevin, better not be you. Bill, better not be you, because we're not doing that. We want to have an outside company go in that may have two or three or four or five inspectors there combing this property top to bottom. And so, again, same thing when we're buying our first flip, our first rental property. We're going to go back, even if it's a single family uh, and it's 100000 or under, we're going to have 
uh, an inspector come in until we get to a point in that market that we have a tremendous amount of confidence so that we can have confidence in our evaluation. The inspector is either going to reaffirm what we've seen or they're going to say, oh, hey, you look, you, they're not going to tell you this. The report will tell you, hey, you missed some stuff. And every time you get a report done, when you start pouring over that report, you're going to keep it. Every time you look at it, the next property you go look at, you're noticing more things because you saw it in this other report. Uh, so uh, that home inspection or that due diligence on commercial uh, property, that is huge. They can give you that great deal of confidence and that confidence allows you to execute. And that's going to be part of your execution in many situations. So let's, let me give you a couple of examples. When we're looking at a commercial property that's say multiple residential properties, okay, uh, they're going to be looking at the condition of the hot water heaters. Okay, when were they last put in? When do they expect they're gonna to have to be replaced again? What's the condition of the uh, heating and air conditioning system? What's the condition of the electrical system? What's the condition of the roofing? What's the condition of the parking lot? Is the parking lot gonna to have to be repaved soon? They wanna know all of these things because if I have to have the parking lot repaved within the first year and I have to have the roof replaced and I have to replace the heating and air conditioning all in the first year, that is going to affect my ability to pay back that loan. OK, yeah. and it doesn't necessarily mean the property isn't worth what I'm buying it for. OK, it just means that I'm not going to have that ability because I'm not I'm coming out of pocket or I'm coming out of profit in order to pay for all those things. That means I'm going to have a diminished ability to pay my note. So they're going to want to understand all of those things. The other thing is they want to have certain things cleared. So if I'm buying properties in certain states, California is one of them, Texas is another. They want termite inspections. OK, yep. if there's a termite yep. inspection and the person finds that there is termites on the property, they are typically going to want an agreement, a clause, or I'm going to have to put the money aside in escrow for treatment of the property for termites at close of escrow. Uh, and it may be some other thing that has to be satisfied. I've actually done HUD homes where there was water sitting in the, the vents. It was a, a subterranean system. It was below the, the, the slab floors, the vents that blew up out of the floor like we see in Texas and Oklahoma all the time, okay? There's water sitting there. I don't know if the water accumulated from the air conditioning system. I don't know if it was groundwater that seeped in. I don't know if somebody just poured water in from the top, okay? But that was one of the things that we had to put money aside for when we closed escrow so that that could be addressed and fixed immediately at close of escrow. They inspected it. They figured out where the water came from. And we had that solution lined up immediately at close of escrow. A lot of times they're going to require that. That is part of our execution strategy. Understanding what that is goes back to our analysis at the very beginning, our first step. These are things that we find out in analysis. This is what I'm talking about, how each step is interdependent upon each other. So as soon as we hit step number three, first thing we have to address in order to satisfy our requirements with our lender or with our capitalization source is to address each one of these issues at close of escrow within a certain period of time before we go on and we do the other things that we planned on doing for our execution. Anything to add? No, I, I just think that that's crucial. To, if you have confidence in the property that's been evaluated and condition of the property, that's going to give you a strong emotional ability to say, hey, let's go do this deal. And that's, you got to have that. You can't pull the trigger. Yeah. And again, having the support for that, whether it's your experience or whether it's people on your team to know that you're making the right choices, that you've done the right things, you've accounted for every dot on every I and every cross on every T, that's going to give you the confidence to, to do this. And you know what? Not just to pull the trigger, it's going to get you excited about being able to do the job. When you're confident about this yep. job, you are going to be anxious about every single step getting this done. And I don't, I don't mean anxious like anxiety, I mean like excited. You know, you can't right. wait yeah. to get this next thing done. Yeah. Can't wait to get this next thing done. When you make 
an offer on a property that you know is great, you are excited about putting it up in front of a capital source because you can't wait for them to see how great it is, okay? You cannot wait for them to fund the deal because you can't wait to get started on this because you know it's a great deal and you know the sooner you get it done, it's money in your pocket and you're on to your next project or buying your Learjet or whatever it is you plan on doing with that particular that profit, okay? But it's gonna be exciting, it's gonna be fun. And that, that's, that is what people like Bill and I live for. We live for that excitement. We live for that chase. We live for that fun. There are people who do it by hunting big game. There are people who do it by racing cars, which is a, was also Bill and I. Uh, there's people who do it with boating, yachting, fishing, whatever it is, okay? But it's a thrill. When you're doing it right and, and you're having fun with it, it is a thrill. It's something that will keep you going, uh, will keep you uh, waking up early in the morning so that you can get a full day and so that you can get all of this done as much as possible. Closing thoughts, Mr. Barnett. I, I think that was uh, a great recap and, and absolutely. So go back and, and look at this makes the fourth show in this series. Mm -hmm. So four shows ago, we did the overview. We did analysis capitalization and okay. So 151 analysis capitalization and execution. Then we took a whole show on analysis, a whole show on capitalization, whole show today on execution. So go back through these and see them again and again until you get it and go out and start doing this. This is the single best time that there's going to be in your life to start investing in real estate is today, right now. Get started. Sorry, show 152. This is show 155. My apologies. So 152, we talked about all three steps. So in this series, you're going to want to watch show 152, 153, 154, and 155, which is where we are now. So if you didn't catch those shows as soon as we're done, which is going to be in just a minute, check out each one of those shows. Yep. Bill, as always, it was a pleasure. Uh, have a great, My great treat, week. Sir. I know it is a holiday. Well, so have lots of fun. Yeah. And I will yeah. check in with you over the weekend and you have a great great week the rest of you happy investing and we will see you back here on tuesday you too brother goodbye everybody good to see you